Thanks for watching The Nine. Let's talk money. Let's get into it. We're going to learn some lessons following the right financial path. It can be hard. It takes some discipline, especially once you hit your 30s. So you might think, all right, I've got a little money coming in now. Uh, I can probably start making more money and saving more, but it can get hard. Yeah. Uh, so we started this uh, trend with Michael Mazarin of uh, the Retirement Education Foundation, where we're tackling it by decade, year. So last week we talked 20s to 30s. Mm -hmm. Today we're talking 30s and 40s. Yep. So now what is different savings wise when you're in that age bracket than the other one? So so Dina, to your point, people are making more money now. They're getting raises and promotions, which is which is great. But life is getting more complicated. We're getting married. We're having kids. There's a home now, and for a lot of people, that gets a little overwhelming. And you know, especially with the kids, a really common mistake people make is they start to stretch too much for college savings for the kids. Now, don't get me wrong. Saving for college is great and it's important, but we cannot cut our own retirement savings in terms of stretching for the college savings for the kids. Because if we hurt our own retirement savings, we're, we'll be in a worse spot down the road and we could be dependent on the kids down the road, which no one wants that. The parents mm. don't want that, the kids don't want that. How do you come up with that number? And I'm sure, I know it's probably different for everyone, but is there, uh, breakdown between how much you save for college versus is it a percentage versus how much you're saving for retirement? So really try to hit that 15% retirement savings for yourself first. If you can hit that 15% of your income for your own retirement savings okay. and have some left over for college savings, fantastic. That's great. But don't reduce your re retirement savings to increase the college savings. And that, that is what Michael, we talked about last week. You said in your 20s and 30s, our goal is to try to get up to 15%. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we made it there. Now we're in our 30s and 40s, but we've got the family, we've got the kids. Now all of a sudden we start thinking about life insurance. So life insurance is tricky because a lot of people don't quite do the right math when it comes to life insurance, especially if we have kids. If there are kids in the picture, we've got to have life insurance for a stay at home spouse and a working spouse. Mm. Because if something happens to a spouse, if, if it's the working spouse, we're losing that income. But not only are we losing that income, that Surviving spouse is now a single filing tax filer, not joint, and we're losing way down the road that person's social security. The death of a, of, a, of a spouse early is catastrophic financially and personally, of course. And also the stay-at-home spouses. If something happens to that stay-at-home spouse, now that working spouse has to have child care mm. and other costs. So both spouses need to have some life insurance. Is that a tough sell to someone in their 30s to encourage it, the life insurance? It is because they feel like they're wasting money. And, yes. and hopefully you never need it. You know, cheap term insurance does not have to be that expensive. Okay. And hopefully you never need it, obviously. But if you don't have it and something happens, it can be catastrophic. Let's it, talk about this. 15%. So what are you doing? So you're you're taking 15% of your income and you're doing what for, for heavy on the 401k? Or 401k what are you doing? And, and if you're 15%, if, if you're, you know, 15% in the 401k and you can save more into the IRAs, that's fantastic. And really 30s and 40s is interesting because that's when people start to get a bit more knowledgeable about the stock market and the economy and people start to develop some opinions in terms of, hmm, maybe I can kind of time this or maybe I can pick the right stocks. And I think we're going to tackle that in the next in the next segment in terms of mm. how that can really get day people trading, yes, and, day all trading things, and all these yeah. things that can really set people back. I mean, here's a stat that'll blow you away. There is a Berkeley did a study uh, about one in 100, one in 100 day traders can beat the market over a three year period. One in 100. One in 100 so day 99 traders. are losing. Yes. Wow. You know, 13 out of 100 people leave a casino a winner. So you have a better chance of leaving at the casino a winner mm. than winning at day trading. Real quick, can I ask, uh, circling back to the uh, college savings because there are many different methods to do mm -hmm. so. Is there one that is better? Is it the 529s? So the 529s are popular because you get a, st a state tax break for contributions. Now the drawback on a 529 is that if you put the money into a 529, that money is now earmarked for education expenses. So if the, you know if, if the child doesn't need that income for education or maybe doesn't go down the college route, if to, to pull it back out for non-education expenses, you could get dinged with a penalty. Mm -hmm. Now there is a not to dive into too deep in the weeds here, there's a new strategy with the SECURE Act where you can roll those 529 unused dollars into a Roth IRA for the kids, which is a fantastic program. Mm -hmm. So if the kids don't need it for school, they can roll it into their own Roth IRA. 
Okay. Yeah, it's good. We're <laughs> dealing one. with that right now with some family members. So um, it, the kids tell us these are nieces and nephews who we open these 529s for. Mm -hmm. They just want the cash. Yeah, give it to me. <laughs> We're saying no. Delayed no, gratification. They will thank you later. Either yes. in your education or in your future. So, exactly. so much. I, I'm so glad we have you for another segment. So in the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to talk more about investing in your 30s and 40s. Perfect. Okay, sounds good. All right, so in the last hour, we talked about the dangers of trying uh, to uh, invest in the stock market on your own, correct? Time well, the market. Trying to time, time the market, market. Yes. Yeah, and trying to stock pick. I exactly, you kind of be a little bit of a day trader. Yes. Let me give you an introduction here. Financial instructor Michael <laughs> Mazarin from the Retirement Education Foundation back with a deeper dive. Thank you, I'm just out here all willy-nilly, uh, just having a conversation <laughs> about all these things. So now we're talking about getting into your 30s and 40s here. Exactly, and again, this is when people start to get more confident with investing in the stock market and sometimes too confident. And just to, just to throw some numbers out, so the stock market is up on a calendar year, it's positive about 70% of the time. So it's up more than it's down, and quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. it's, on, it's up on average 10% per year. But there is volatility along the way. Even though a, a, the stock market might finish up in a certain year, we have on average 14% drawdowns during the year. So it'll be a choppy ride to get there, but on average it does go higher. And what people typically try to do, once they get a little too confident, is they think they have a sense for when to get in, when to get out, mm. and they hurt themselves. Because really, when things get really choppy, think of COVID, how choppy the stock market was during, the, during you know, March, April 20, uh, 2020. The best days come after the worst days. Mm -hmm. And so if, in, during COVID, April 2020, we had single days in the stock market that were down 10%. 10% in a single day, yeah. really scary stuff. So people were scared, they got out. The very next day, plus 10%. Mm -hmm. So if you're down 10%, you get out, the next day is up 10%, you're way behind the eight ball now. So instead of trying to time these things, just stay in it for the long run, let the stock market do its job. Yeah, it's the, you're not timing the market, it's time in the market, Exactly. Right? To use that exactly. old uh, quote. Um, but how long, so when you're sitting there, you're in your 30s, 40s, you're planning on making these if you're buying into an index fund or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're planning on doing that for the next what, 30 years or something, exactly. right? Exactly. And so if you're if you're planning with retirement money, money we're not going to touch for 20, 30 years, what the stock market does today, this month, this year, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Over the next 10, 20, 30 years, it is going to be going up over time. And sure, we're going to have events along the way, but when we have the events, you just can't panic. How much of the mental aspect of investing plays a part in this too? Because uh, I'm 45 years old. I can't go back to my 20s and start investing in an index fund that might get you, you know, 8, 10, 12 percent uh, mm -hmm. compounding interest over time. You mm -hmm. wake up, you're 65 years old, and you got a couple of million bucks in the right. bank. I can't go back to that. Um, and when you're 45, the mental aspect of not taking those major risks to kind of uh, kind of go in and get what you thought you would have earned if you got in back then. And that's how people get themselves in trouble yes. because people really think, okay, you know what, maybe I started a little, a little late or I made a few mistakes and I can catch back up. Mm -hmm. If I can just time this right or find the next Apple, the next Amazon, I can really take off and catch back up. People get hurt much more often than they, than they get caught up trying to do that. I mean, we've all seen the stories of, Oh, this person found the next Amazon stock and you should invest now. Those are just stories. Right. No one has a secret sauce. There's no algorithm that people have. You know, a funny example that I love, there are hedge funds that purchase pictures of Kroger parking lots from satellite data. So they have pictures of Kroger parking lots. They're counting the number of shoppers, they're counting the bags in the cart, and they're taking that data to extrapolate how much do they think Kroger earned that quarter and compared it to last quarter. Mm those hedge funds still get it wrong. So they have satellites in the sky taking pictures of Kroger parking lots, and they're still getting it wrong, and people think that we can stock pick market time. It can't be done. Yeah, somebody with an a app on their phone right. thinks that they're, that's why the index fund, which is a compilation it's of- It's a basket of all the stocks. Right. So instead of trying to find the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack, just buy right. the index. You're right. going to win over time. Whether it's you know the NASDAQ, the Qs, or the, the, the S&P 500. The Qs, S&P 500, yeah. the Dow Jones, Mm -hmm. Pick your favorite. There are, there are pros and cons. NASDAQ's a bit more aggressive. S&P's a bit more diversified. But they all work.
Very good. And the f last hour, in case you missed it, we talked about that magic number. When you're saving for retirement, you're looking at saving 15% of your income. Trying to get to 15% of your income. And if you, if you can do more, fantastic. But really getting to 15 is a great number. Great stuff. Um, all right. Thank you, Michael. And you can find Michael uh, at retirementplanningedu.org. Michael Masseran, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate good it. Good stuff. Until next time. And we'll be right back.